Um, I would now like to welcome everyone to the next presentation. Um, at this session, Dr. Douglas Stewart, our conference chair and hematologist from Calgary, will provide a thorough discussion on the evolution of lymphoma treatment from when it was first discovered and treated at present time. His presentation will help us understand how different classes of drugs work in the body, current treatments for the major lymphoma subtypes, and future for lymphoma treatment. Uh, today we thank and welcome Dr. Douglas Stewart, a professor at the University of Calgary and a renowned hematologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Centre. Dr. Stewart has been practicing in medical oncology for over 20 years at the Tom Baker Cancer Centre in Calgary, where he was a member of the hematology and breast tumour groups, the blood and marrow transplant program, and from 1999 to 2016, led the provincial hematology tumour group in Alberta. He is a professor in the Departments of Oncology and Medicine at the University of Calgary and completed two terms as the hematology division chief. Uh, Dr. Stewart's research interests involve lymphoma and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and have resulted in over 135 peer reviewed manuscript publications. Uh, in October of 2017, he took on the new role of the senior medical lead at the Cancer Strategic Clinical Network. So thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, for th taking the time today to present on this topic to the lymphoma community. And we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'll do my best to cover most of the task that was assigned to me, but it's quite a daunting task. If you can imagine 70 or more different kinds of lymphoma and all the different treatments and all the new things coming. So, so really I'll touch on on some of those things. And I'll try to bring it back to some overarching principles for people, but happy to answer some questions. So um, let's see if I can advance the slides, which I can't seem to do. How did Sarah do that? <laughs> mm. OK. Okay, sorry, just one sec, Doug, let's uh, get you control. Uh, are you able to switch now? Not yet. Okay. Um, it, it might be on your computer, sorry. Let's see. Okay. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> um, I, I probably will never be invited back to do this because I'm challenged with all this technology. But anyway, here we go. <laughs> You're doing great. So my, my objectives um, are a brief review, uh, some of it overlapping with what Sarah presented on basics of lymphoma biology, because I think you can't really understand treatment until you understand lymphoma a bit. Uh, and then we'll get into some discussion about lymphoma treatment, um, some of the evolution, mechanisms of action of different types of treatments. And that'll get us into clinical research studies and novel therapies. Okay, so again, what is a lymphoma? So, so I tell people, as Sarah did, that it is a cancer. And so what's a cancer? It, it's a group of cells that have uncontrolled growth. Uh, they invade through the body and spread through the body. And lymphoma is a cancer of lymphocytes. So lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell that's important to the immune system. And as you've heard, lymphoma is not a single disease. Uh, but you probably are aware that uh, people talk about lymphoma as a blood cancer, as opposed to um, carcinomas treated by medical oncologists that are considered solid tumors. So you hear the term blood tumor, solid tumor. And yet anybody with lymphoma would say, you know, my lymphoma felt pretty solid to me. Uh, so why is it considered a blood cancer? 
as Sarah mentioned, it, it all starts with this uh, hematopoietic stem cell that normally lives in the bone marrow, and it gives rise to all the different blood cells. And so the first thing it does is it differentiates, it divides into either a myeloid progenitor or a lymphoid progenitor. And the myeloid progenitors give rise to different types of white blood cells like neutrophils and eosinophils, as well as uh, platelets that contribute to a blood clot if you cut yourself, and red blood cells that carry oxygen. And if you get a cancer of these myeloid progenitors, <clears throat> that would be something like acute myeloid leukemia or chronic myeloid leukemia. Whereas the lymphoid progenitors, uh, they can develop a cancer and that's called acute lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoblastic lymphoma. And then they go on to form, uh, these lymphoid progenitors go on to form lymphocytes and eventually uh, B lymphocytes form plasma cells that make antibodies or T lymphocytes are your cytotoxic killer lymphocytes that can directly kill infections. And they're supposed to help kill cancer cells. Uh, so that's how we divide lymphocytes into B lymphocytes that make antibodies and T lymphocytes that kill infection directly. And so this, this is where we see the lymphomas is in the lymphocyte population. If you have a cancer of plasma cells, that's called multiple myeloma. So you can kind of see as we go through this differentiation process from a stem cell in the bone marrow, you, you can see where all these different kinds of blood cancers arise. But that's not to say, you know, if you get lymphoma, you know, very often it forms solid tumor masses. Why are there 70 different kinds of lymphoma? Well, this is uh, again, an illustration of a stem cell, a lymphoblast, differentiating through the different cell lineages until you get to plasma cells or plasmacytoid lymphocytes. And you can get cancers developing at every step. And that gives rise to different types of lymphoma. Um, we all kind of know about the blood system. We see these blood vessels in our body, but people might not be aware of the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is shown on the left. Really, it's large numbers, hundreds of lymph nodes we have in our body. The largest numbers are in the neck, in the armpits, through the chest, abdomen, pelvis, and then down to the groins. They're all connected by vessels called lymphatic vessels that actually do communicate with the bloodstream. Then there's certain organs like the spleen, which is high uh, in the left upper abdomen towards the back. And then things like tonsils and adenoids in the back of our throat, they're really all part of this lymphatic system. Um, so on the right, you can see when you get lymphoma, certainly the lymphoma cells can affect all of these structures, lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, because the lymphocytes, the normal counterpart of the lymph lymphoma cancer cells are just pre-programmed to, to migrate through the body to attack infection wherever it might be. So the lymphoma cells can do that too. So it's quite uncommon that lymphoma is a localized disease. It's usually fairly advanced stage when it's first diagnosed. So that's different than, than other kinds of cancers like carcinomas. So how can it present? You heard it can present as lumps, swollen lymph nodes or lumps in organs. It can cause dysfunction of an organ. So the organ stops working well. It can block tubes, so it can block uh, airways in the chest for the lungs. It can block blood vessels, causing swelling. It can block intestines, causing a bowel obstruction. It can block the kidney tubes, causing kidney failure. So, so how can lymphoma present? It really can present any way it wants. So it can affect every living tissue of the body. You can't get lymphoma of your fingernails or your hair but you can get lymphoma anywhere else. Um, it can also present with uh, symptoms, fevers, night sweats and weight loss, uh, sometimes fatigue, uh, itching, but these three fever, night sweats, weight loss are considered B symptoms because that's part of the staging for lymphoma. Um, what book do we use to kind of keep up to date with all these different kinds of lymphoma? Well, so, so, Everybody who treats lymphoma has the 
World, World Health Organization classification of lymphoma books sitting on their shelf. Uh, it's got a lot of great information in it and describes all these different kinds of lymphomas. Um, so I, I'm not going to list 70 different kinds, but here are some of the more common types of lymphoma. So remember there's B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So there's B cell lymphomas and there's T cell lymphomas. Um, so the B cell lymphomas um, can be either indolent or aggressive. The most common indolent one by far is follicular lymphoma. Whereas the most common aggressive ones are diffuse large B cell lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. And although there's 70 some different kinds of lymphoma, these three lymphomas constitute almost two thirds of all lymphoma. So that's how common they are. Um, for T cell lymphomas, the only indolent ones really affect the skin. Um, so pretty much all the other T cell lymphomas are aggressive lymphomas. So as you heard, aggressive lymphomas grow quickly. They usually present with symptoms. They're causing trouble. People don't feel well. They can be life-threatening early if they're affecting major organs. There needs to be treatment on a fairly urgent basis, usually not within hours or days, but usually within weeks, the treatment needs to get going. They are potentially curable with standard chemotherapy or high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. Indolent lymphomas usually slow growing, um, often present without symptoms. So it's something, you know, somebody notices a lump, but otherwise the person feels very well, um, may not need treatment for months or years. And for certain kinds like follicular lymphoma, there's a low rate of actually spontaneous remissions where the lymphoma just goes away and very often never comes back. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, it's highly responsive to many types of treatment, you know, these indolent lymphomas. But in terms of pure chemotherapy uh, that we used to use alone in the past, pure chemotherapy alone didn't usually cure the disease. But you never say never. And uh, you know, we have treat patients in Calgary who are more than 20 years after receiving plain old chemotherapy for advanced follicular lymphoma. So, so who's to say they're not cured really? Um, but these low-grade lymphomas may transform to aggressive lymphoma. So further mutations of the cancer and they can become aggressive. So treatment for lymphoma, you know, it really is a partnership uh, between the patient and the healthcare team. Uh, so there is a role for each, a role for the healthcare provider is to realistically identify potential treatment goals, uh, discuss the treatment options that are available, and inform about advantages and disadvantages of these options. Uh, the role of the patient is to inform us of the priorities you have regarding acceptance of risk or benefit, um, and help well, really make the ultimate choice uh, amongst available treatment options. So in broad strokes, there's four goals of treatment. Uh, one might be cure, where and a cure is um, you put the disease in remission, so there's no evidence of it, and there never is a relapse, so it's a permanent remission. Um, the, the second goal of treatment, even if we can't ultimately cure the disease, so at some point it relapses, but maybe the second goal still is a significant improvement in the length of survival so that people live much longer. Uh, a third goal would be to prolong the remission. So even if we can't improve overall survival rates, hopefully we can give a period of time where the lymphoma is in remission and causing no trouble. And then we try to maximize the length of that remission. And then the final um, goal of treatment might be just to control symptoms. So we can't probably even put the disease in remission, but we can shrink it down enough that, that people feel better, the symptoms go away, so we can improve quality of life. So typically the greater the goal, the greater the potential toxicity. So that's why there needs to be this discussion and sharing of information, because we have to weigh the risks and benefits of different treatments. Um, so it often comes up how to estimate prognosis. So for sure, we need to look at the type of lymphoma, uh, the stage of the lymphoma, if it's limited or advanced stage. There are clinical prognostic index scores that can help. 
they usually involve many different clinical factors. So two common examples in most include age and stage of the lymphoma. But there's many others, uh, blood tests, sites of involvement, these sorts of things. Um, biomarkers would be uh, proteins or uh, genetic mutations that we can detect right within the cancer cells, the lymphoma cells. So we can look for these different biomarkers and, and sometimes if they're expressed or they're not expressed, we know that that's a lymphoma that's easier to cure or harder to cure. And then what treatment people receive. So sometimes it's not just a choice, but sometimes people simply can't tolerate certain really aggressive treatments and that can have an, an effect on prognosis. So we have to look at all these things. So it's quite complicated. If we look at uh, say five-year survival rates um, um, by different lymphoma subtypes, you can see both for indolent and aggressive lymphomas, there are lymphomas that have excellent you know, five-year survival rates, well over 70%. Uh, some approach 90% depending on stage. Uh, then there's groups of lymphoma that have an intermediate prognosis, kind of 50 to 70% of people are still alive five years later with, with some of these kinds of lymphoma. But then, remember, these are averages. So, so that means half the people actually do better than the average. And then there's some lymphomas that are harder to treat, uh, say like peripheral T-cell lymphomas, uh, where the survival rate is under 50% at five years. Uh, the stage, so you already heard the staging system, stage one, two, three, four, so I don't think I'll go over it again. Um, and then there's these B symptoms, fevers, night sweats, and weight loss. But in general, we try to lump people into limited stage or advanced stage. And limited stage would be this early stage one or two disease, but no bulky masses. Uh, it depends on the lymphoma where we consider a over seven centimeters or over 10 centimeters and, and no B symptoms. So, so this fever, night sweat, weight loss. So you really have to have all those things to have limited stage. Whereas any of, any of the stage three, four bulk or B symptoms would be advanced stage. And the idea is if you have limited stage, likely you could have less intensive chemotherapy, sometimes no chemotherapy at all. Uh, and maybe just local radiation if it's a, a stage one, for example. Whereas advanced stage typically uh, involves more, more intensive chemo, either the choice of the drugs or the number of cycles of treatment. And, and we might only give radiation to, to a site that previously was bulky or had evidence of residual active lymphoma on a PET scan after the chemotherapy was done. So, so we do kind of think of this uh, limited or advanced stage concept when we decide what treatment is best. So the general approach to managing lymphoma is to establish the diagnosis. So we for sure need a, a proper subtype of lymphoma. We need to determine the stage by mechanism Sarah went over. We need to develop this treatment plan. And in most academic centers, it actually is multidisciplinary input. So we have rounds every week where there's Oncology, hematology, radiation oncology, um, pathology, radiology, all sitting around a table talking about all the new uh, cases of lymphoma that we saw in the past week and together coming up with treatment recommendations or at least options for discussion with the patient. Uh, we need to know the patient's other medical problems, wishes and goals because that would influence the treatment. So then we administer the treatment and then afterwards we ensure appropriate follow-up because lymphoma is a disease where even if it relapses, there often is a second chance at cure. And so, so it's not just uh, the first treatment that's important. The second treatment is also really important. Uh, so this slide um, is an example, not of 70 lymphomas, but you know a dozen or so really just illustrating that the subtype of lymphoma matters because treatments differ depending on the subtype of lymphoma. So, so the top three, for example, the most common is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So, so we use an antibody called rituximab and CHOP chemotherapy for most people. Hodgkin lymphoma is a completely different chemotherapy regimen called ABVD 
or places like Calgary, we intensify to escalated BACOP for advanced stage poor prognosis patients. Follicular lymphoma is an indolent lymphoma. So some people initially have watch and wait, or maybe just have involved field radiation to a, a stage one. Or if they need chemotherapy, the standard is bendamustine chemotherapy with rituximab, followed by rituximab maintenance for a couple of years. So you can see even the three most common lymphomas, the treatment's completely different. And then as you go down the list, you know, you don't really see any similarities between the different kinds of lymphoma. So that's why it's so important to know what kind of lymphoma we're dealing with. What about the treatments? So over the first 50 years of managing lymphoma, there really were only four advances in treatment that improved survival rates for lymphoma. So, so the first thing was radiation going back to 1960. Um, and the people who were cured from lymphoma with radiation, for the most part, were people who had this limited stage, early stage lymphoma. Um, the next thing that happened in the 70s uh, was combination chemotherapy that included a drug called adriamycin or doxorubicin, and that was for aggressive lymphomas. So CHOP chemo for diffuse large cell, ABVD for Hodgkin's, and but we used treatments like CHOP for indolent lymphomas as well. So that was the 1970s. People played with new chemo drugs and did a lot of BIP versus BOP versus BAM studies, but none of that really improved survival rates for lymphoma. So CHOP and ABVD kind of continued to be the standard treatment through the 1900s. Uh, the late you know, 1990s, uh, the treatment that came around was high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant for relapse lymphoma. And that was shown to improve survival rates uh, when applied diffuse large cell Hodgkin's. And we have data that strongly suggests that's the same for follicular lymphoma. Um, and then early 2000s, we got rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody, an immune therapy directed against B cell lymphomas. And it really now is a mainstay uh, in combination with chemotherapy for most B cell lymphomas, sometimes with chemo and often as a maintenance after chemotherapy for certain types of lymphoma. So, so kind of really that's it, you know, for uh, 50 plus years, it, it was radiation, adriamycin based combination chemo, high-dose chemo at relapse, and then the addition of rituximab to chemo for B-cell lymphomas. So what about the last 10 years? Well, we're starting to see more rapid advances. Some of the things on this slide, to be fair, haven't yet shown improved overall survival rates, but many have. And many of them work so well, it's just expected with time, we will see the survival benefit. Um, so the top two are using maintenance rituximab for indolent lymphomas and mantle cell lymphoma. Um, bendamustine is actually a new drug for us in North America. It was used in East Germany for many years, uh, but then the Berlin Wall came down and everybody got access to bendamustine. And lo and behold, this single agent chemo drug was more effective than CHOP chemotherapy for indolent and mantle cell lymphomas, which is nice because it's less toxic than CHOP. So, so that's the new thing for indolent and mantle cell lymphomas last 10 years. Um, and then we start to see a whole lot of novel agents, these new drugs um, that we're um, finding success using for uh, specific types of lymphoma. So ibrutinib, I'll show you, is a BTK inhibitor. So it, it inhibits a specific enzyme that translates a growth signal to this cancer cell. And so that's been shown very effective for relapse mantle cell lymphoma um, and initial therapy and for relapse CLL and for relapsed lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma that is also Walden's Trom's macroglobulinemia. Uh, a new drug called venetoclax inhibits the BCL2 protein. So BCL2 keeps cells alive. Um, so venetoclax inhibits that. So it kind of forces the cell to die 
Um, so it's very effective for relapsed CLL and again, relapsed lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. Uh, we're starting to see antibody drug conjugates. So it's kind of a combination of immune therapy and chemotherapy, but the chemo drug or the toxin is actually attached to the antibody so that the, um, the, the chemo drug isn't freely released through the body. So it minimizes the side effects and it actually concentrates the effect at the level of the cancer cell. So a drug like brentuximab vedotin has this antibody that brings the chemotherapy agent to the Hodgkin lymphoma cancer cell. And, and it minimizes the side effects that people experience. So, so 2012, you know, publications that it worked very well for relapsed Hodgkin's. Um, and after that, it was shown to help prevent relapse after stem cell transplant for relapsed Hodgkin's. And more recently, it's been reported as part of frontline treatment for, for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, other new things, uh, other new immune therapies. Um, so nivolumab, pembrolizumab, they're drugs, they're called checkpoint inhibitors. And, and really cancer cells are able to evade the immune system uh, by many mechanisms. And, and one is it, through this protein called PDL1 that it produces that works on a T lymphocyte protein called PD1. And it tells the T cell that's supposed to kill the cancer cell, it just tells it to go away. So it helps prevent the T lymphocyte, the immune system from killing the cancer cell. So the drugs like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, they inhibit this process. So, so now the T lymphocyte is able to attack the cancer cell and kill it. Um, so, so very effective drugs for a variety of cancers and certainly very effective for Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and uh, so other immune therapies, other antibody drug conjugates that I'll come back to, and then newer immune therapies. And we have a whole talk on this um, uh, tomorrow on CAR T cell immune therapy. So, so a lot of things are happening in the last 10 years. So hopefully, you know, we're gonna see a lot more survival improvement for lymphoma patients. So this is a, a little cartoon, uh, very complicated, um, kind of shows the cell surface, the cell membrane at the top. So that, that would be a cancer cell. You can see the proteins that stick through the cell membrane. Um, and then all these little circles with initials there. Um, th these are enzymes and proteins that carry a growth signal or a signal to divide. Uh, through to the nucleus of the cell. So it activates the cancer cell, basically makes the cancer more aggressive, grow more, spread more. Um, and, and so all of these drugs that are in the boxes that you probably can't read um, really inhibit different steps in this process. So they're called uh, signal transduction inhibitors, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, small molecules. A lot of these are just pills which is great um, and don't have a lot of side effects for the most part, which is great. Um, and I'm not gonna go over all of them. You can imagine, it, you know, there's, there's, there's literally 50 to 100 of these things in clinical trials for lymphoma. Uh, these are the ones that have shown activity and are kind of in the final stages of determining their role for lymphoma treatment. And for certain ones like abrutinib and calabrutinib, uh, for CLL, for example, their roles already identified, mantle cell lymphoma. Idelalisib is a PI3 kinase inhibitor, so right in the middle. And, and so this drug and duvalisib, duvalisib, these drugs, the PI3 kinase inhibitors seem to be most effective against follicular lymphoma. So again, there's lymphoma preferences for these new agents. Um, so those are drugs. Um, Real important advance in all cancer therapy and is immune therapy. Um, and so the first one I already talked to you about, which was rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody. So it's, it's made um, outside the body 
It targets a CD20 protein on the cancer cell. You just infuse it into people, either into the bloodstream or even under the skin, and it gets absorbed. Uh, and it goes and binds to these cancer cells and helps the immune system target the cancer cell and get rid of it. Um, uh, we're, we're getting even fancier antibodies, so something called bispecific antibodies that I'll show you where, where one end, uh, end of the antibody binds to the cancer cell, another end of the antibody actually binds to these T lymphocytes to bring the T lymphocytes closer to the cancer cell to, to trigger the cell killing with, from the T lymphocyte. Um, I talked to you a little bit about these antibody drug conjugates, and I'll show you a picture. Um, the nivolumab we talked about, which is to inhibit this PD-1, PD-L1 protein interaction between cancer cells and the T lymphocytes. And then the CAR T cells um, are created to directly uh, attack these tumor cells. So we'll talk a little bit about more, more about these things. So on the right here, you see this antibody. It's just a cartoon of an antibody where one end of the antibody uh, is directed against CD20, which is a protein on the surface of lymphoma cells. And on the right side, the uh, antibody is directed against CD3, which is an antigen on the T lymphocytes. And, and so, you know, as I said, it brings the lymphocytes in close proximity to the cancer cell and helps the T lymphocyte kill the cancer cell. Um, so, so again, these things are just made, these antibodies are made and can be infused into people who have cancer. Um, and, and what we're seeing is very high response rates so far in phase two trials. So this slide shows for follicular lymphoma response rates, over two thirds of people are having a response to this treatment despite having received many other treatments in the past. Uh, for diffuse large cell lymphoma, there was a study showing for people who had three prior treatments that these uh, antibodies give a response in, in half of people who had multiply relapsed diffuse large cell lymphoma. So very active agents, but we need to figure out exactly where they belong in the course of treatment um, and could they, should they be combined with chemotherapy. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done yet but this is called a bite or a bispecific antibody. Um, so very promising. This is uh, an antibody drug conjugate. So you can see up here uh, under number one, you have this antibody that's got a drug or a toxin bound to it. So it's infused into the bloodstream. It, uh, the antibody part binds to the cancer cell, the cancer cell internalizes the antibody, the toxin is released, and then it kills the cancer cell. Um, so, so hopefully there isn't much of the toxin or drug that's released into the body in general, but it can be very effective at killing the cancer cells. So for lymphoma, we have brentuximab vedotin uh, directed against CD30, which is on Hodgkin lymphoma cells, and um, certain types of a T cell lymphoma called anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So very effective against those diseases. Polituzumab would be directed against uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So, so you know, very interesting class of drugs. Um, CAR T cells. So, so what we do here is we actually genetically engineer the T cell to express a protein that is directed against the lymphoma cell. And once bound, it activates the T cell to kill the lymphoma cell. So, so uh, very interesting technology. What happens is the patient themselves, they, they donate the, the T cells. So blood is drawn, the T cells are isolated. The T cells are genetically engineered to express this protein. It's called a chimeric antigen receptor. And that's what binds to the lymphoma cell grow the, the T cells. So there's many millions of these cells that we then infuse back into the patient. And then the, the, T's, the CAR T cells hopefully go and kill the lymphoma cells. Um, so, so far, very promising 
data for multiply relapsed diffuse large cell lymphoma patients and other B cell lymphoma patients. Uh, very unique um, toxicity profile with often very intense toxicity early on in the first week or two, something called cytokine release syndrome with fevers, low blood pressure, organ problems, and neurologic toxicity with um, delirium, confusion, sometimes seizures, brain swelling, so very severe. So in the early studies, there actually was a fairly high rate of admission to the intensive care unit to manage these side effects. As, as time goes by and we're getting a little smarter at trying to prevent or treat these toxicities, um, it's becoming safer and we're not seeing as much severe toxicity, but, but this is not without toxicity. Um, Long-term, it's usually quite well tolerated. People recover and do really well. Occasionally we see problems with prolonged low blood counts. And so that, that can happen. And then low antibody levels. So as been mentioned before, sometimes after we treat lymphoma, the treatments we give affect normal antibody production. And then if you have low antibodies and have infections, you might need gamma globulin replacement therapy. So that's CAR T cell. We hear more about that tomorrow. It brings up this whole issue of clinical research studies. So they're absolutely essential. But I know sometimes people worry when they hear, oh, a clinical trial, I'm going to be a guinea pig. Um, so just to try to reassure people, you know, that um, we absolutely need these research studies um, to test new treatments, either alone or in combination with standard treatments, or to test new methods of administering these different treatments. And, and it really needs to be done in human beings who have the disease, who have lymphoma, to try to determine which treatment is best. Um, You'll hear about different phases of studies of clinical trials. So phase one really looks at the safety and toxicity and tries to find the best dose of the treatment that is safe and, um, and is the, you know, below the maximum tolerated dose. Uh, the point of phase two trials is to determine efficacy, activity of the treatment. And, and that's usually measured by a response rate. So what percentage of people in the study have the lymphoma shrink by more than half? So that would be called a response. And so if there's high response rates and it's safe, it's taken to a phase three trial. And typically that's a direct comparison between the new treatment and the prior treatment or the current standard treatment to determine if the new treatment is better than the current standard treatment. And this in Canada is really the only way these new treatments are approved and funded for use is a phase three trial. Um, these clinical trials are approved by ethics committees. They have to meet rigorous government and medical standards. Um, it's never allowed to proceed if it's thought to be a risk to patients. Uh, there has to be detailed risk, uh, research on the new medication before it's tested in human beings. Um, patients who participate have to give informed consent to participate, and they have the right, right to withdraw that consent and leave the study anytime they want. So, so these are really important um, trials, and this is how we advance care. Um, so this slide, uh, you don't need to read it, but it just kind of illustrates you know, a dozen different clinical trials looking at novel agents that seemed really promising to treat diffuse large cell lymphoma. And at the end of the day, none of these studies in phase three study showed improved overall survival rate for everybody in the study. And, and, and that was despite the fact, you know, they were so promising, some centers around the world were actually using them as part of standard of care. But obviously, if it doesn't really improve outcome, we're just adding toxicity. So it is really important to do these studies. Um, I mentioned there has been a lot of advances that do improve survival rates for lymphoma. Um, and, and also that is determined through clinical trials. So, not, so certainly not all clinical trials are negative, but a negative study is still really important. Um, this is, uh, I guess, one of our success stories in lymphoma is uh, treating Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, 
So it dates back almost 200 years uh, when Thomas Hodgkin first described people with enlarged lymph nodes and spleen. And then as you know, the treatments uh, I already explained to you, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, people started to use radiation. Um, it was the 70s that people started to use ABVD. Autologous stem cell transplant started in the 80s and 90s, really. Um, new chemotherapy regimen, escalated Biocop, was developed in the late 90s. And now 2010s, we have immune therapies with brentuximab, antibody drug conjugates, and nivolumab, pembrolizumab, the PD-1 inhibitors. Um, so the bottom right curve um, really illustrates how survival has improved uh, over, the, over the decades. So back in the 60s, for Hodgkin lymphoma, we think of such a curable cancer. Back in the 60s, the cure rate for Hodgkin lymphoma was about 20%. And so it, it jumped up to about 50% um, up in the 70s. And, and now we expect survival rates of 80% plus for Hodgkin lymphoma. And it really through, is through these treatment advances and participation in clinical trials looking at these novel agents. So in conclusion, you know, lymphoma is treatable, often curable. Uh, one treatment's not right for everybody. Selecting the right treatment is a shared decision between you and your physician, so ask questions. And these are the kind of questions to ask. What, what kind of lymphoma do I have? What treatment's recommended? What is the goal of this treatment? What are the side effects? Do other treatment options exist? Are any clinical trials available? And then ask yourself, do I understand and agree with this treatment plan and goal? So I think with that, I'll stop and happy to address a few questions if there are any. Hi, Dr. Stewart. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Um, so thank you for that presentation. It was very informative and very interesting to learn the history of lymphoma treatments and where we are today. Um, so we do have a few questions uh, and we can just jump right into them. Um, one of the questions was regarding uh, the average frequency of transformation from an indolent follicular lymphoma to an aggressive form. Yeah, so um, it's approximately 3% a year for the first couple of years, drops to 2% per year and eventually 1% per year. But overall ballpark, people think of about a 30% risk of transformation. Uh, for most people who unfortunately die from follicular lymphoma, the vast majority of those people have experienced a transformation. But fortunately now, you know, we have survival rates over 80% at 10 years for follicular lymphoma because the treatments are working so well. Okay, great. Um, the next question actually has to do with uh, the current pandemic and how it's affected clinical trials. Yeah, initially, you know, to be honest, it shut them right down. <laughs> so back in uh, the spring, um, really our clinical research studies shut right down. But over the summer, they've reopened. And, um, and that's, I think, when we saw the pandemic die down a bit over the summer. I worry a little bit about what we're seeing in the fall because we're seeing the, you know, the COVID rates going up everywhere. Um, so I worry about what's gonna happen. But obviously, if the pandemic is raging and it's felt to be unsafe to proceed with research studies, or people are simply, the healthcare system is overwhelmed, then it's thought we should probably should not be doing clinical trials. Okay, great. And I have, a, we, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and this question uh, was, uh, a patient is asking that they were told that if a lymphoma recurs, it wouldn't be treated the same way as a prior occurrence. Is that still true? So yeah, initially you can imagine if you had a treatment and then the lymphoma relapsed, you probably wouldn't want to give the same treatment again. You want to try something different. As much as possible, if there's a chance of cure, we go for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we wouldn't want to do the same thing again if it didn't cure the disease the first time. Mm -hmm. so, so for the most part, we are changing treatments during each, each course of therapy. Okay, great. 